No, yes. Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, okay. Um, let me make sure we're doing this right. Camera. No, well, I don't see it coming up there, but I'm just going to let it go because I've recorded this talk a few times. I'm Margot Burns. Um, I'm a 17th century specialist on the Salem witchcraft trials, but it seems today I'm a, a 20th century historian. Uh, this morning I talked about uh, Saturday morning cartoons in the 1960s, and we're going to go up to the next decade into the 1970s. Um, how many people in this room have heard some version of this thing that the girls ate moldy bread or something like that. Okay. Um, the purpose of this talk is basically at the heart of what historians do. How do we know what we know? And from the number of hands up here, you know this. Um, and all Salem people, when we, get, uh, when we get going, there's always somebody. And uh, sometimes kind of hard. The more times you hear it, the harder it is. There's somebody, and I'm having a conversation, and say, well, write down, I want to write down the word ergot, you know. Well, okay, and then I just, I read someplace, it's coming. Well, I don't, I, well, something, weren't the girls like on magic mushrooms or something? They come up with some interpretation of this, that there was some kind of uh, mold that had caused the initial uh, affliction, the, the, rep, the things that the girls were doing, that they were flipping out and tripping and things like that. And that explains the Salem witchcraft trials. Um, but those of us who are, spe Spanish, uh, are specialists in Salem witchcraft trials go like his. <laughs> uh, eye rolls, the whole thing. And one of the difficulties with that, and two years ago here at, um, at, at history camp, um, I was listening to Marilyn Roach. Did anybody get a chance to hear her today talking about the Gallows Hill thing? Yeah, well, she was talking, and at the end, there was somebody in the back said, well, I heard, and we're all uh, the, uh, less in the front, and um, when he finally got to the, the finish of the sentence, three of us went on. <laughs> um, and uh, when I gave this talk last year, um, his name, I, and I know his name, he came back and he came up to me and said, yeah, I thought that was really rude. His wife even thought it was really rude. And I said, listen to what I have to say today because I have reacted to my own, you know, <sighs> um, and I think you're going to find this interesting. Um, part of the reason that Salem people or experts don't like this is it basically doesn't fit with what we know historically. And yet so many people know it. And if you start talking to a Salem expert, they'll go, they roll their eyes and go, no. Uh, and then they'll talk about this woman, uh, this paper. Uh, this is Ergotism, the Satan Loosed in Salem. And this is where the Ergot story came from. Uh, this was in Science Magazine in April 2nd, 1976, um, in which uh, this woman, Linda Caprell, posits that maybe there was a biological reason for the, um, for the symptoms. And as a scientist, um, she went through to find all the different features. You know, was, the, was there rye, the grain that it usually grows on? Yes, there was. Oh, were they in a swampy area? Well, all the different things that a scientist would ask. And at the end, she said, well, it's not conclusive. Um, she was a scientist. She was an undergrad at UC Santa Barbara. And she took this course. I actually contacted the people at UC Santa Barbara and said, you got old course catalogs? <laughs> and I found it, uh, because I'd been talking to Linda Caprell. And she said, oh, I had to take this history course to graduate. She was a senior science major. And she had to take a humanities class. And there were all these little um, seminar things. It was probably in with a bunch of freshmen. Um, and so she was in 159A on women, history of American women uh, in the colonial period to 1870. It's amazing how much she remembered from that class. Um, I did try and get a hold of uh, the intern, <laughs> the, the um, uh, assistant teaching the, the class, and um, I found she had just retired. I never heard back from her. I was, I was going to do a deep dive on this thing. Um, but she did turn into a history professor. It took a little while for me to find her because she didn't end up getting her doctorate. So that was a little harder, but I was on it. Um, this is Linda Caprell. 
Um, part of the reason we know this, even though we had that um, that introduction online is that she appeared in a couple of documentaries fairly early on. And this one, I don't know if you remember it, but Leonard Nimoy had a program. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is about Salem. And half of it is about Laurie Cabot, no, Salem's witch. <laughs> Most of it is about Laurie Cabot. And oh, it, it was fascinating. But the other half was on this. Well, actually, it's more like a third of it. And let's let Linda describe it for herself. Let me make sure the audio is right. Come on. Yeah. Hold on. Well, hold on just a sec. I bet it's my computer. There we go. I'm going to play that again. Oh, it's not. This is not good. Come on. Rats. And I'm the tech person for this. Ah. Well, there she is, but you can't hear her. Ah. OK, let's go back. Uh, let me make sure my, my sound isn't off. Well, this will make some of the other ones kind of hard, too, won't it? Uh, that should be good. Um, I've been doing this all day. Let's see. Let's just see if we've got anything for audio. Let's see if I play it this way. I have no audio. Huh. Ah. And this was behavior was what started. Okay, let's see if we can now get that into here. And now here. No. OK. I'm going to try and make it as loud on this. I'm really sorry, but you know how technology is. OK. Here we go. It's going to come from my computer. I'll face this out. How about that? Because we can work around technology, right? OK. Here we go. I think that the, the original causes of the girl's behavior, and this was behavior was what started the crisis, was eating contaminated bread. And that the bread is contaminated with a parasitic fungus known as ergot. Ergot is a fungus which grows on grain, most especially in rye, and it has a number of potent pharmacologic agents in it, especially one called isoergine, from which LSD is derived. The symptoms that are alluded to in the trial records are pinpricking, choking, disorderly behavior, convulsions, hallucinations. These are all the kinds of symptoms that you would expect from convulsive ergotism. OK, that kind of sums it up. Um, this is rye with ergot. It grows on it. Um, ergot comes from a French word that has to do with a, um, a spur on a fighting cock. So you can see they sort of come out that way. And it's purple. Uh, and you can see it. If it's on the grain, you can see it. Um, I also think that uh, the farmers then probably knew what it was. And it was mold on their their crop. Um, you will hear some people that say, oh, they didn't know what it was, because we're so much smarter. Um, some of her logic was, and she said she was looking to see where those girls lived. And it, it, is anybody familiar with this map from uh, Boyer and Nissenbaum? Uh, their book, Salem Possessed, came out in 1973. And this map is famous, because um, it articulates where the accused lived and where the accusers live. Um, and this line, which is kind of artificial, says, oh, well, the ones on the west were the accusers, and the ones on the east were the accused. Um, and they point a bunch of things. Uh, ben Ray has deconstructed this whole map. But in uh, mid-1970s, this is what they had. And um, she looked at this particular place. This was where the water was coming through, and that would have been swampy land. And swampy land is where rye is more likely to get ergotized. Um, she also had an amazing number of books that we still use. Um, these are, these are, anybody who does Salem has these books. So she was really going for the primary sources. And she went to the map. So Boyer and Nissenbaum were the experts at the time. And she went through and tried to make her case that this was possible. Um, she never said conclusively. However, <clears throat> uh, within seven months, in the same magazine, Science Magazine, um, we have a couple of guys, Spanos and Gottlieb, 
uh, who published a complete refutation, point by point, every little thing. Just no, 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 no. Um, symptoms didn't match. You know, why didn't more people get it per household? Um, symptoms don't come and go you know, in sync with everybody else. Um, they were well between bouts. It wasn't like they were poisoned, so they were well. And also they said there was a vitamin A deficiency to have this ergotism if you had to have that. But these were farmers who had milk cows, and they were on the coast, and they were having fish. So they wouldn't have had a deficiency, which he claims um, you need to have that deficiency for ergotism to really take hold. So he just went, he and his uh, graduate student really just reamed it within seven months. Um, the critical thing here is they're claiming that um, ergot, well, and it's true, ergot comes from LSD. Um, or L LSD comes from ergot, sorry. Um, and it was discovered in the 1940s and kind of like, oh, but by the way, um, Albert Hoffman is known as the, the father of LSD. Um, and I just, my shirt, the pattern is the LSD molecule. I thought it was funny. <laughs> so. so we go back in the 60s, LSD was um, super groovy cool. They were psychedelics. Um, and you have Timothy Leary, teaching a psych class at Harvard in 1964. You've got Tom Wolfe, the electric Kool-Aid acid test. Um, even you go back a little further, doors of perception. Um, so there, there was this whole idea of you know, the life of the mind, and you could blow your mind and expand your mind. And there was a whole culture of that. Um, and let's see if we can get um, Timothy Leary to talk about it himself. I mean, this is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he and his buddy, Richard Alpert, uh, were short-lived at Harvard after this kind of stuff. Um, and they were experimenting with psilocybin, especially as magic mushrooms, and just really expanding their minds. Uh, you may know um, Richard Alpert as Ram Das. Mm -hmm. He went on to be sort of a guru for everybody. And uh, oh, poor Timothy Leary, he kind of got really creepy and weird. Um, so there were two, they were working on the same thing and they had different paths. Um, in the 60s, we're finding a lot of psychedelics being used. Uh, this human bee in, uh, Timothy Leary is there, the, you know, Golden Gate State Park, all those things that you can think of, you know, psychedelics and cool. And um, here we have uh, rock bands going on Haight-Ashbury. That was the center of that. Um, one of the things that I found out in talking to Linda <laughs> is that um, she and her husband lived in Haight-Ashbury. And then he went off into the Navy and was on a minesweeper in Vietnam. But she lived in Haight-Ashbury. And originally, I was thinking, well, that's how she knows. And she said, no, not really. It was just cheap. And that's why the hippies went there, because it was cheap. So you know, you can, you can, sometimes you can draw conclusions because you have two points. And you go, ah, that's why it is. And guess what? It isn't always that way. Um, and then we had different festivals. Um, this isn't actually Woodstock over here. This is a festival that got canceled and people showed up anyway. Um, <laughs> they were. They, huh? Potter Ridge? Yes. I lived five miles from the place. It was ridiculous. Yep, that yeah. Was yeah. Acid, a dollar. Um, and then we get back. We got, we got Timothy Leary. He's really, he's, he's, he's dropped the, the tie and the stuff. And now, now he's kind of guruing out. Let's see this one. Narcotic drug of all. Don't politic. Come close. These are old men's games. Impotent and senile old men. They want to put you onto their uh, old chess games of war and power. Drop out. Uh, tune in with. Take off your shoes. Uh, get back in tune with God's harmony. Surround yourself with beauty and sacred objects. You can't get caught in the conforming, rote, lockstep, which we call American society. Wow. <laughs> so he's going off there. But we also have the culture in the 60s of psychedelics. And we see it in popular culture.
this comes right out of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and that was one of the, the main books, the reference books, that a lot of the people doing psychedelics were working upon. And um, uh, John Lennon really liked it, and uh, he even got Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And I swear, <laughs> he was on the Dick Cavett show and expressed very, he was very surprised that, you know, it's not about LSD. <laughs> and he said, then everybody said, oh, the first three words, ladies in the sky with diamonds, LSD. Oh, I didn't know. I never thought that. And he said, uh, the straight face on Dick Cavett, that I had to go back and look at the, the titles of all my songs to see if anything else spelled out something weird. Um, yeah, well, OK. We also get Peter Max doing this kind of, you know, everything's on an astral plane, the nice psychedelic colors. Then it starts, that, this is sort of in the, the popular culture in one way. We got the hippies and the psychedelic thing. But you know it's gotten into the, um, the public conscious when pulps start um, talking about LSD. And a lot of them were, were sexual. Acid rock orgy, psychedelic sex, you know, acid party, all these different things. And you start seeing them pop up. So it was part of the culture. Um, even though we've got things in, in that, we also have things on Time and Life and Newsweek magazine having these. This is, these are most of them in 1966. Um, the Time magazine uh, up in the, oh, I don't have it on that. Yes, the Time one over here. That's from 69. So people were starting to see this. People in the mainstream were starting to see this. And it, it was a, it was frightening for a lot of people. Um, I thought it was really interesting to have popular science do it. Here we go. Non-cop, non-hippie report of the unvarnished facts. Um, so it was getting to be known. But also, I was in this era. I was in um, middle school. Well, I call it middle school now. Junior high, and we had a drug awareness program, and it had a book about that thick, and it had films that accompanied it. We learned about all the different drugs. The only thing I remember is I had to keep track. OK, uppers and downers, uppers, amphetamines, downers, barbiturates. OK, oh, amphetamines and uppers both start with a vowel. I mean, these are the ways I was remembering it. And then I went, oh, one's red and one's blue. Uh, barbiturates starts with a B, blue. OK, so that's, I mean, I was a kid who got no exposure to any of this stuff. So that's how I was remembering these things, because they weren't a part of my life. This particular course of study in my chemistry class um, when I was in the eighth grade changed that. Um, this is a part from a case study about LSD. This is a film I actually watched. No, it couldn't be. And I looked down at the hot dog, and there was a face on it. <laughs> Eyes, nose, a mouth. I had put the ketchup to where it looked like his hair. He started telling me that I couldn't eat him. And he had a wife and seven kids at home to support. <laughs> uh, yeah, and they're all sort of like that. They have that, you know, lava lamp type thing and the weird music. And it's always the, the nice kid who goes and somebody else gives them drugs. Um, but that one with the, um, with the troll doll. <laughs> it's a troll doll. Why is that? Um, so this is how I got introduced to this. And it, just, it was all stupid. I mean, I was that, you know, that kid who just didn't know this stuff. And this was my introduction to drugs. Um, one of the other things that was also in people's minds when they're thinking about drugs, and this will take us um, even to ergot, ergot that, that mold. Um, people had heard about this because of um, this book. Um, it was published in 1968. Um, when I found this, this is about something that happened in 1951 in France, where um, a whole town, whole town was poisoned by the bread. Um, and it made it into uh, um, Life magazine in 1951. Um, I, as I always want to do, I said, who's this guy that wrote about this France, village in France? And I looked him up. He also has a book about um, the UFOs in Exeter, New Hampshire. <laughs> he liked to investigate weird things. So, um, But this, this, this actually you had a lot of people dying. People were poisoned. The whole town ate the bread from one baker. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these are the things that are contributing as we get up into the 70s. So here's the article. Who here reads Science Magazine? 
Well, kind of, yeah. Sometimes, okay, well, Science Magazine has been around for a while. I asked Linda, I said, okay, you were an undergraduate. You wrote this paper for a class, a required history class. How did it get in Science Magazine? And she said, you know, naivete, I mean, she told one professor who just laughed at her that she was sending it in, so I guess that sort of um, makes one want to do it more. And um, it got published. And it, it's very well known to anybody who studies Salem. It's sort of like, oh, that one. And sometimes I have people go back and read it. I, you know, I'll say, have you read it? Oh, yes. Well, if you go back and read it, she actually gets the history right. She gets the history right. And um, looking at with with fresh eyes, one thing, as you get to know somebody, even those, oh, Linda Capral's article. Well, I, I had a really wonderful um, email exchange with her. Um, and she answered all sorts of questions. And I, I finally went, yeah, I like Linda Capral. I'm going to defend her, what she did. Because um, at the beginning, I was going, oh, rolling my eyes. But Linda Capral really had some interesting things to say about the course of her life with this stuff. So who reads Science Magazine? The science editors for newspapers. Um, this Edelson in New York Daily News, he was the first one to pick it up. And um, then we have a fellow at the New York Times, Washington Post. Um, well, here we go. There's some, um, here we go. Call Salem Witch Hunters Hams on Rye. <laughs> The Daily News, okay, Washington Post, Salem Witch Hunt, just a bad LSD trip. Uh, New York Times, Salem Witch Hunt in 1692 linked to LSD-like agent. Um, and then here in the Boston Globe, where are we, come on. It was a bad trip in Salem. So then, uh, and this is within days, this is within days of that magazine, that weekly magazine hitting the newsstand. So they really sort of had it that week before um, and then one enterprising UPI stringer in Lowell um, decided he would contact one of the guys in Boyer and Nissenbaum. They were the local historians who did all this work just a couple years earlier. They were the ones that um, pulled out all the primary sources. Actually, they were kind of innovators um, in the 1970s about going back, looking at the primary sources, and looking at the, the sociological um, implications and in, uh, the implications from those um, kinds of re interactions. So they were a big one on saying it was neighbor on neighbor. So if that's the thing you know, um, then they, was they were just looking at Salem Village and just those and talking about the disputes over the minister, um, disputes over property, um, uh, cutting down trees on somebody else's land, and then, oh, well, later on you have an opportunity to accuse her of witchcraft? Great. Um, so they've done this stuff, and, and this guy, um, well, he, he called him up and said, hey, what do you think of this? And he said, basically, uh, really? I don't think so. You know, why did it only happen there? Why just that year? You know, it just doesn't strike me as, as plausible. And he really, I, I talked to him too. Uh, and he said, well, it really wasn't a big deal. However, once you put this thing in a newspaper, um, it has a life of its own. So if you, if you are doing something viral today, how do things go viral today? The internet. You post one thing and boom, the whole world can do it. How do you go viral in the mid-1970s? Wire services. Wire services, absolutely. You get something on the wire. So we have major newspapers who've carried this. So um, we end up with um, things in Biddeford, Maine, Honolulu, Hawaii. Winnipeg, Manitoba, Biloxi, Mississippi. It went, uh, so far on newspapers.com, I have found over 200 versions of these articles appearing all over the place. Finally, I mapped it out. I couldn't find anything in just four, four states. <coughs> and this doesn't even include Canada on that, clearly. Um, so, and, and I'm kind of surprised about Maryland, but I looked, I, I didn't even just do a search. I went through everything because I knew the days that it would appear. Um, but that's pretty fast. That's pretty fast. Within, within a week of that magazine coming out and being on the wire services, AP, UPI, Knight Rider, um, and then there, the Washington Post had its own feed, and the New York Times had its own feed, and people were picking it up. Um, they really liked to sort of put that uh, Nissenbaum thing about, I don't really think so, up against this 
um, story from uh, Lord, Linda Caprell. And it's really interesting how they did it. She said she thought they ginned it up. I, I'm liking that phrase a whole lot. And quite often the, the titles of the newspaper articles was student, researcher, new idea. And then Nissenbaum was historian, professor, expert. And you know how we are. We always like somebody who finds something that nobody else has done. We really like the underdog and somebody who figures things out that the experts couldn't figure out at all. So that really made it sound like it was some big academic debate. And you wanted to root for the underdog on it. Um, so that sort of that gets interesting. You know, you hear that there's some debate. There really was no debate. It was just this article that went viral had a life of its own. Um, now, it's one thing to have something like that go out. It had to land on fertile soil. So um, let's take a look at what was going on in the 70s. Um, LSD was no longer um, that psychedelic, cool, groovy kind of thing. Uh, when we see stories of Charles Manson and um, Patty Hearst, there's LSD in those stories. Those are national news stories. <laughs> we also, in 1975, um, the Rockefeller Commission did a whole thing on the CIA. And in 76, um, there was the, um, let's see, which is the name of the church committee. The government was looking into what the, the, Navy, the Army and the CIA and the FBI were doing. And they were uncovering that um, they had been using LSD for mind control and for um, true serums and things like that. Um, these hit the news. Here we are in the Washington Post. Panel finds CIA and illegality, but backs the record. Um, here we are and more in the Washington Post. Same page, same page. CIA infiltrated 17 area groups and gave out LSD. They were testing it. Right now, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad thing. You know, you could just get it. And they were surreptitiously dosing people. Just wanted to see what it is. And they were giving it out and they were just sort of experimenting because, you know, we're, let's see what we can use it for. They would actually give it to each other. They'd dose each other in their, um, in their coffee. Um, the stories are just like weird. Um, you know, I'm going, oh, guy, good. The C guys in the CIA are pranksters. <sighs> um, and on the same page, I'll say the, they rejected any suspicion. They were involved in JFK's death. Um, so they were all looking at all these different things that the CIA had done. Um, and when you look at it, it, it reveals, you know, testing on human subjects, uh, surreptitious administration of, of LSD. Well, in this, in this whole thing of dosing each other, um, there was a family in 75 that claimed that earlier, in the, is it the 50s? Yeah, the 50s, um, that their father, husband, father, had been dosed with LSD by the CIA surreptitiously and then went out a window of a hotel in New York City to his death. And with all the talk about LSD and all that, um, it was interpreted as a suicide. Uh, his name was Frank Olson. If you get um, Netflix, there's a um, thing called Wormwood. It's kind of interesting because his son gives a lot of um, testimony in this documentary. And basically, the family has concluded it was a wet works op from the CIA, that this guy was being critical of how the CIA was doing things, especially with LSD. So they got him to this and sent him out the window. So uh, yeah, this is all happening around then in the 70s. So people had this idea of what was going on with um, LSD. We also have um, international stories. Uh, in Japan, they were saying that CIA drugged prisoners. Um, and then over here, we've got more in Australia. CIA used LSD in Asia. They were saying that they were doing it um, to prisoners of war. Um, so we have a lot more things about that. It was evil. It was starting to be bad. The army say, used LSD unauthorized for spy agencies. Um, it was everywhere. This is just 1976, April of 1976, the same month that Lori Caprell's article came out and was all over the country. Um, it also is the time, so okay, so what, you don't care about the CIA, you know, of course they're doing that stuff. It was also in 76 that they that come up, came up with Love Canal. They discovered that this toxic waste from uh, business was poisoning kids. 
Um, and if you're local, the uh, Grace and Beatrice Foods one over in Woburn, uh, that was a little bit, it was 73 to 79, they're doing that. So people were already thinking about toxins in the environment affecting children. So we're, we get a little more buy-in from that. Um, 70, the 70s were a big time for looking at um, the world around us. So the EPA was started in 1970. Did it die last year? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, 72, we had the Clean Water Act. 76, the Toxic Substances Control Act. So if you had a toxic thing in, in your product. Um, 76, there were um, conservation things. And in 1980, we finally had the Superfund Law. So people were really looking at poisons and toxins in their environment. And it was, it was horrific. It was really horrific. Um, so it landed on fertile ground, but it didn't initially go anywhere. We had those guys who refuted it point by point. Um, it really um, took off when an historian, Mary Matosian, um, decided she was going to take up the standard of ergot and Salem. And this was, wasn't until 1982. And she, you see some of the same pictures, um, and she basically I said, yeah, I believe it. Um, although, if, if you read some of the rest of her stuff, she even had it down that um, ergot and mold caused the French Revolution. <laughs> she really took it to an extreme. But it hit the papers again. Um, so, new study backs thesis on witches. Yeah, you know, they're going back. They know people already know this story. So, this is how it gets. This is how academia ends up being in the public press. Um, in her own Baltimore Sun, remember I couldn't find the thing in 76 in Maryland? Well, there it is. New study, Bach's thesis on witches. Um, and then, oh, here's, here's the Baltimore Sun one. So this was coming into the fore. Now, remember those guys that Spanos and Gottlieb who had, had gone after um, Linda Caprils? Well, I don't know where, where the graduate student was, but um, Oh boy, Nick Spanos was back. And yeah, went even longer <laughs> refuting it. Sort of like, the first one wasn't enough. OK, so he was back in the thing. So being the person I am, I said, who's Nick Spanos? So I looked him up. And um, between 67 and his death in 94, he had published three books, 22 chapters and other things, and 213 articles. I challenged a lot of academics to match that um, in a very short period of time. And I said, well, why did he care? I mean, his specialties were stuff about hypnosis, um, multiple personalities, false memories, all sorts of weird stuff. Well, he liked debunking those things. And oh my goodness, some of the other things, speaking in tongues, he had all these different kinds of things. And at, when he died, and there were a lot of obituaries, people would describe what he was like. And he must have been manic. I mean, I, I don't want to diagnose something, but they would have a conversation. One person said, I have a conversation on one day, one afternoon with him about, oh, we could do some of this research. By first thing in the morning, he had already written a draft. Um, so he would just get his teeth into things and just go for it. And clearly, he was out for blood with this um, ergot thing. And he just, just tried to get rid of it. Obviously, he didn't, right? Um, it also started getting into um, the imagination of uh, fiction writers. Anybody remember this? The book came out in 1995. Um, and I, I like the, the Spanish one, Los Archivos de Salem. <laughs> they really made no bones about it. Um, the acceptable risk was um, drug uh, creators and experiment um, were testing it on themselves. Didn't end well. Uh, it takes place here in, in Boston. But that was an acceptable risk, a risk they could try it on themselves. And it started to look good, and then it didn't. Uh, they made it into a film with Chad Lowe. <laughs> you know, so um, it, it really hit public uh, imagination. Um, then we started getting something else in the late 1990s. Um, the whole idea that it could possibly have been encephalitis that was causing this. Uh, Lyme disease, Huntington's chorea, all these different possible things. And notice that they're looking for medical, biological um, explanations for this. And it, this sort of piggybacks on the ergot one, because there was something, something medical that was going on. 
So, um, and somewhere around here in 2001, um, on PBS, Linda Capital appears again. And um, this is Witch's Curse. Uh, all these things, anytime you see a documentary on Salem, there, I, I'm going to guarantee you will see screaming girls, right? right? You're going to see a hard-nosed um, judge. They never even say anything. They just <laughs> grimace. Uh, you'll see a minister that's even practicing his sermons, especially so the girls could overhear, or he's on the pulpit. Um, and then you see dirty prisoners in an ox cart going to the gallows. And um, then you see a noose waving in the wind. And then you see two naked feet. That's in every single one of them, um, including that recent one on, from the Smithsonian Channel. I look at it and go, um, but you see those things. And, and this one, yeah. This one had it too, but here's Linda talking about it, and she'll always say things like, ah, oh, suddenly I realized. You know. It was almost as if the description in the pharmacological reference had been taken from the trial records themselves. It was just, it was just extraordinary. And, um, and that for me was a real eureka moment. Yeah, eureka moments. She just kept finding things and it all fit together. Um, but this is also something from, from that particular, um, yeah. While the bewitched settlers of Salem may have been suffering from something like this, a bad acid trip, surely they had no access to LSD. Surely. Did they? Ooh. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, all these things, and I like her, I, I, I like what she said, they gin it up, you know, and this is whenever you see a documentary, um, they'll interview all sorts of specialists and experts, and then in post-production, they add in a whole lot of stuff like that. Um, every documentary I've been in is like, yep. Um, the one exception is, who do you think you are? And they actually tell the experts what the story is that they're going to tell the celebrity. And if we have any corrections or clarifications, they actually listen, which is really nice. And it spoiled me for any other documentary, um, because usually in a documentary, they ask you lots and lots of questions, and they don't tell you what the script is. So um, in this same PBS thing, they talked to Mary Matosian. Yay. So here we are. And they, notice that there's a map in this one as well. If outbreaks of ergot poisoning were prevalent, did they coincide with the rash of witch executions across Europe? It was Professor Mary Matosian who made the startling discovery. I got into Europe uh, because I had to account for the fact that witchcraft persecution happens in certain years and not others, in certain places, not others. So I had to cover the map to make sure I wasn't missing something. The witch trials that ravaged Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries were localized in very specific areas, as shown here. In Britain, the great witch hunts were centered around Essex and East Anglia. Matosian discovered that the areas where witch trials and executions took place <coughs> did coincide with the major rye-growing regions. But not only that, in that 200-year period, the weather conditions in Western Europe were different from today. They were perfect for the formation of ergot on rye. Ooh. Um, uh, what's the thing about correlation is not causation? Yeah, I tend to think that all those things on the maps map with lots of different things. Um, but here she is. She's pushing it. And of course, um, then we have the, the reviews for um, the home video. And if we go here, and it goes even crazier. Um, because of the way she's going at it, all those witch hunts were traced to the same cause in every instance. And I'm going, really? Kind of thing. So in all the instances. So they've really bought into this thing that Mary Matosian has. Because when I first talked to Linda Caprell, um, she said, oh, I wasn't the one that made it crazy. You know, It's Mary Matosian. I said, no, 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 everybody in Salem blames you. <laughs> They don't remember Mary Matosian, but Mary Matosian was an historian. And she was also, she wasn't having these debates in the public press. She was having debates about her book, here's her book, um, in academia. 
And one of the things is, you know, you, you have a book review, and then if it's a bad one, um, quite often they'll ask the author, do you want to respond to this? And she would do that. Um, Linda Caprell, when Spanos and Gottlieb first refuted her article seven months later in Science Magazine, um, said, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, so we're still seeing things in the newspaper, puzzles of the past, this is 1989, and it still shows up. So this is a worksheet for school, and <laughs> I paid $2 for it. Actually, I bought it twice because I forgot I'd gotten it the first time. So there's some teacher out there um, that's doing it. So this has, basically, you watch the video and you answer questions. Essentially, what did you hear in the video and you regurgitate it. Um, but we also see this on um, uh, different websites. There we go. Toxic mold causes people to go mad. That's 2017. Um, here we go with Encyclopedia Britannica may have caused the witch trials. And then this one, I tell you, this is January this year. I had so many people on Facebook say, have you seen this one? And notice it's from the BBC. There it is. Can an autoimmune illness explain the Salem witch trials? So I got another version of how that happens. Um, I like asking people, how do you know about this? And some of them will say, my textbook, my professor in college told me, and so here's a line from this one. Maybe ergot poisoning did play some role, but hey, not bad for an undergraduate paper. Um, and then this is for people trying to get life credit for, for high school. And um, it said, if the village doctor had only known about ergot poisoning, then this tragedy could have been avoided. Really? Um, here's another one. Mindscape says, critical reading. Um, one of the most concrete studies published in Science in 1976 by psychologist Linda Caprell blamed the abnormal habits of the accused on, you got it. Um, and it's sort of like, it's a concrete study. Linda herself said it's not definitive. Because remember, when you, when you get into science versus humanities, scientists use an iterative method. And in history, you can't do that. You say, well, what would happen if this? You only have one possibility. But it kept showing up. There's abnormal psychology, plants in the human brain, the handy science answer book. Um, and then this book came out. And um, the fellow who, who did it, um, Eric Simon, is a professor of biology at, the, at um, New England College in Henniker, New Hampshire. And I called him up. I said, well, you have it in your textbook, too. And it goes like this. He talks about it, but he said she began with an observation, the symptoms, led her to question whether this could have happened. So her hypothesis, she wanted to test that, so she examined the historical record. She made a prediction when she was doing that, that the facts would be consistent. And guess what? Her results were suggestive, though not conclusive. This is actually the best reading that I've ever read of what happened and how her article works, because this is what she was doing. <coughs> Historians say, oh, well, this and this and this. It must be so. That's not how scientists go about it. Um, I mean, this is, I can go back here. Um, now, there's been one paper that has actually refuted Spanos and Gottlieb. It was written in an undergraduate seminar with Mary Beth Norton um, at Cornell. And he basically rips them a new one. Um, and says, no, uh, that vitamin A stuff, oh, that's been long disproved. And he went through point by point to take apart Spanos and Gottlieb. Um, it's only an undergraduate paper, but you can find it online. So, um, and I'm the one that's going to go over, right? Anybody know who these two guys are? No? OK, that, that's um, Stephen Nissenbaum and Paul Boyer, those two guys who published things in the 1970s. Um, and this is. Um, this is their book. And remember the map? Um, it's really kind of interesting to see how people evolve their thoughts, because this is what the map was originally. Yeah. Doesn't quite meet that same thing of the, the north-south line. And um, Ben Ray has gone in and uh, used um, satellite imagery to try and figure out what was going on. And there are problems with their map, especially if it goes to that as their original piece. So um, basically. Um, I, I find myself supporting Linda. I think she's getting a bad rap. Um, but one of the things that I found in talking to her, and she said, well, you know, um, Paul Boyer, his daughter, joined my department. 
And sometimes he would come to our faculty gatherings. So that was kind of cool. And she finally said who she was. And he said, oh, I was one of the anonymous readers for Science Magazine for that. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so uh, I, I found this thing on how we know what we know. And that's what it was a study in. Now, at the end, people say, so do you believe it? And it's sort of like, it's not a matter of whether I believe it or not. It's this was how scientists approach data versus humanities people. And I think when we talk about crossing um, disciplines, there are problems with that. If you don't understand what the principles are of, of the um, scholarly investigation. So that's, that's really what I think happened. So um, thank you very much.